Every year, migratory birds make their epic journey across Europe. South in the autumn, north in early spring. They have been flying here for thousands of years, but recently, there have been fewer in our skies. Some species have even vanished entirely. Why? My name is Christian. For over 20 years, I have watched and studied birds. I learned to pilot a microlight to fly alongside them. I have been sharing this magical experience with anyone wishing to see these wonders. But I can't bear standing by and watching these birds disappear. What could be discouraging them from flying over our lands? The expanding towns? The disappearing meadowland? Are there any other reasons? I want to understand and act. I want to do everything I can to help these birds continue their seasonal pilgrimages. And so, I have dreamt up a slightly mad project, a school of migration. I will fly off with a small group of geese, discover with them the pitfalls and dangers of our modern world, and find a new way of crossing our lands. Then, I will leave them to their freedom, with the hope that my pupils will retain their journey's lessons and one day pass these on to other wild geese. Come with me. Let me show you the secret routes of migratory birds. Here we go. I am flying with my birds. It's August, and this is the moment I've chosen to begin our great journey. We are leaving the plains of Alsace, borrowing the route from the storks, then over the forests of the Vosges to Auvergne from the Loire all the way to the great marshlands of the Atlantic coast, a migratory bird's paradise. Oh, sorry, I've forgotten to introduce you. Here are my eight young geese. All of them are gray geese, the most common breed in these lands. The five brothers and sisters with the yellow beaks are from the Scandinavian side of the family and the three pink big sisters from the Siberian side. So here I am, the head of this little family of wild geese, all born this spring, but in incubators at my home. So, how did I become the adoptive father? First, I stayed with the eggs day and night, talking to them right up until they hatched. It's my voice along with my face that the goslins recognize. That's me 20 years ago, learning how to do it. Geese identify with whoever is with them in the first few hours of their lives, even if it's a man. Over the coming weeks, I would reinforce this bond. The same method has worked for my geese today. If they seem at ease with the microlight, that's because I taught them to waddle, flap, and then fly alongside. That's why they have no problem following me today. Grey geese migrate from northern Europe to the south of Spain to spend the winter. In the wild, they learn the route of this migration by following their parents on the way down. On the way back up, they often manage it on their own. 
flying in the crisp morning light, the landscape appears clearly. Castles, church towers, villages, rivers. So many landmarks for my student navigators who wedge the route into their memory with eyesight that is eight times sharper than mine. They calculate their position using the stars and the sun and possess cells capable of sensing the Earth's magnetic field, a compass built into their eye and a GPS in their beak. They are perfectly equipped, and yet it is me they follow. <laughs> It's hot, beaks open, their tongues catching the tiniest drop of moisture. So many clear signs, they are thirsty. Below us, a gravel pit with strange turquoise water. Out of instinct, a wild grey goose would not land here. Time for the first lesson. place for a swim. Indeed, my geese aren't keen to dive into this Caribbean water. Here, nothing is wild. And yet, it's a safe place. By overcoming their suspicion, Magis have one more resting place on their route. Taking advantage of what man has done to nature, that's the moral of this afternoon. We've been flying since morning. Hunger is setting in. They are still unaccustomed to long flights. In the wild, they feast on tender shoots of soft grass and seeds. But here, no meadows, just cultivated farmland as far as the eye can see. It's the same story elsewhere, nothing to peck at. I decide to sit down near a cornfield. Lesson number two, taking advantage of the harvest. Seeds. Leaves, corn, a gourmet feast for starving birds. I'm afraid the smallest of the pink beaks winds away through the rows of corn. I keep my eye on her, but let her go. Migration is also growing up. You soon learn caution. Lesson. The leftovers from the harvest are a godsend for migrating birds. Some farmers know this and leave the stubble for a few weeks before plowing. My geese have learned to take advantage. Bellies full, we leave the plain of Alsace heading for the Vosges Mountains.
above the forest, the geese stay close to the microlight. Instinct tells them that this ocean of trees beneath offers no suitable place for landing or space to take off in case of danger. I decide to take us down onto this reservoir. Closed in and surrounded by trees, its black water fascinates the birds. For their first ever long flight, my geese have had to draw on their reserves. They will spend the night feeding on algae in the water and drinking. Drinking water whose taste they will memorize, like the address of a good hostel to visit again one day. Auvergne. We're at the foot of the Pre-Marie volcano. As with every new landscape we fly over, conversation picks up. They're a chatty bunch, geese. They sound their position to the group to avoid a mid-air pileup. They cannot turn their heads to look at each other. It's also a way of checking everyone's there. They recognize each individual call. They expect me to join in with these conversations too. I do my best. The geese at the front spotted this enticing peat bog long before me. You could call the migration of wild geese the tour of France's lakes and ponds. So vital to them is water. On the ground, I have to admit, it's a perfect sight. Any predators like foxes or birds of prey would be spotted from far away. As for the other guests, they seem quite harmless. As a goose, your first task in a new place is to really take in the scenery. After the exertion and stress of a flight, nothing beats a good swim. The water's full of great things too. Larvae, insects, roots pulled up from the bottom. Thank you. 
I'm amazed at the things they can do without ever having seen or learned them from anyone. It's innate. Maintaining 20,000 feathers, not just as decoration, but a flying machine. Fuselage, wings, rudder, propeller. With the tip of their beak, they apply wax from a gland on their rear, leaving their feathers waterproof, flexible, and resistant to parasites. One flaw in their plumage can cause exhaustion over a long flight. Real contortionists. I couldn't teach them that. I keep a close eye on the little pink beak. A little cheeky, she wanders off from her brothers and sisters. Inquisitive, adventurous, or careless. The grass is always greener, as they say. Neck stretch upward. The big male is not happy. Instinct tells him that a lone bird attracts predators and puts everyone in danger. She stamps the ground. She's worried. I do not interfere on purpose. Eventually, the oldest pink beak sister takes control, bringing the little one back to her senses, back to the fold. Stretching out and swaying the neck is how we say hello. Get back before it's too late. The incident is over, but a rift has appeared between the pin beaks and the yellow beaks. We don't need to wait long before the group indulges in a little argument. Goose to goose. The yellow beaks quickly take the upper hand. They are dominant. The pink beaks will have to tread carefully. Every family group needs a hierarchy. It reassures everybody. Nothing like a grooming session to repair family bonds. I am always touched by the attachment my geese have shown since they were young. I'm attached to them too. And yet, I will have to leave them at the end of the journey. Thank you.
By the evening, their wings are itching. It's an irresistible urge. They are young. They've got to move. They've got to fly. A summer's day, hot and cold currents whip up the air in the valley. I make the most of it. They will soon need to face high wind, storms, turbulence. So, kids, you wanted some exercise. Tonight's lesson: acrobatics. If the air was visible, this valley would be a rough sea with waves crashing against the cliffs, lashing my geese and my machine. Here come the gusts. I keep counting them in my head. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One's missing. Eight. The group is breaking up. My geese drift from one side to the other, above and below. It would only take a second to lose one. She would try to find us, flying until complete exhaustion, and eventually abandoning us. She would have no chance of survival on her own. That's my greatest fear. Above a certain altitude, the turbulence stops. The air carries us like a strong current, calm and smooth. They have to learn this for the day they must cross higher mountains alone. With the tips of their long outer feathers, or flight feathers, each bird learns to feel the slightest breeze and shape themselves to it. Not flying, but surfing. No longer pink or yellow beaks. We're a family. The sky is ours. September. A thick fog keeps us grounded in the morning. Flying is impossible. There's a constant fear of losing one another. The geese stay close. As usual, the little pink beak explores the surroundings alone. In a group of geese, there's always one more inquisitive than the others. And that often benefits the group. I let her go, but keep her in sight.
Then everything happens at once. The sun breaks through the fog. The big male surprises everyone and preempts my signal to leave. I have to catch them up. Our little explorer is caught off guard. In the wild, she would have a slim chance of rejoining the group. I force the squadron to fly close to the surface to stay visible for the little one. At the last moment, she rejoins the group. The pink beaks get close to their little sister. This accidental lesson of caution will have been useful to her, I hope. We leave the lake, the mountains and Auvergne. A new day, a new challenge, the Loire. For millennia, migratory birds have followed the courses of rivers. There, they have places to feed, to land and to rest. A direct route to the sea, a route that never changes. The leading birds maintain an impressive pace, 30 miles an hour. The strongest take turns at the front and use 20% more energy. The others glide in their wake and are drawn in like the cyclists in a Tour de France by the chasing pack. We look for a riverbank. But after the autumn rains, the swollen Loire has swallowed its islands and eaten into its banks. The big male and the little pink beak compete for attention and lead the group. we are fighting against the wind. Our ground speed is practically zero. My geese are tying themselves out for nothing, and my motor is beginning to suffer. No wild bird would be stupid enough to carry on. We have to land, quick and safe. Bonjour. J'arrive à vol depuis le sud-ouest. Il y a beaucoup de vent, beaucoup de turbulences. Est-ce que je peux me poser sur votre terrain At this quiet little airport, I'm not taking a big risk and being on the ground gives me a chance to check the motor and leave when the conditions allow. Oh, 
Qu'est-ce que c'est que ce bazar Allez. But leaving this little gang of teenagers unsupervised is a mistake. In the end, I think this little fright will be useful to them. <laughs> Airports offer tempting meadowland for migrating birds, but they have to learn to be cautious, get to know their limits. I have to resolve myself to spend the night. Securing the campsite is still vital. Foxes attack at night. They fly off into the darkness and I lose them all. A fox's cry puts them on alert. Like every night, they only sleep for a few minutes at a time, with only one eye shut, like me. In the morning, the wind has dropped, but the clouds are low. The micro light is soaked. The thick cloud cover would swallow us like flies. We'll have to wait. They're getting restless, so I'll let them blow off some steam. traveling today, just to fly by. The little explorer and her sister venture to where the current is strong, like a treadmill beneath their feet. They drift where I wouldn't want them to. In the middle of the river, the trap is set. Live ducks, one foot tied down. Call passing birds and fade ducks. 
make it seem like a peaceful place. A hunter's hide. Empty? Useless hunters. They have to get back quick. I hope that this fear will stay in the memories of my geese, and they'll remember to avoid similar traps elsewhere. Hunting is one of our traditions, but it kills 17,000 of the 50,000 gray geese that still attend this journey every year. Weather window signals our departure. The oldest of the pink beaks appears to memorize the location for next year. Direction? Due west. The stages follow one another between gray and blue sky, between countryside and town, where another formidable rival species has been living for a long time. Man, he is everywhere. But his activities are not always harmful to wild birds. Here's a chance for a new lesson. Some motorways have become navigational tools for birds, visible by day and night, less winding than the rivers. The big male and the pink beaks are mesmerized and can't look away. Some species are already used to these easy-to-follow routes. Tired? Well, try one of the many rest stops along the way. A few 38-ton trucks, okay, but no hunting and no hassle. farms are not the geese's best friends. With headwinds and low visibility, the instinct for geese is to fly low. Surprised by these giant fans, they panic and their group breaks up. Some get lost. I could pass further away, but I prefer to flirt with danger. Tame their fear. Every day, new windmills spring up like mushrooms. Next time, they might be less surprised. It's October, and autumn is upon us. Day after day, we follow the Loire and its fertile plains. Their super sharp eyesight allows the geese to distinguish all the shades of green and to pick out the best grass by instinct. They're never wrong. Well, almost.
My pig beaks have drawn the group to the most delicious looking part of the course, the green. This time, their comfort around people comes in useful. I encourage them further. Other species have already gate-crashed public parks and gardens where people presume they are decorative birds. This peewick swan, for example, has probably come from Siberia to spend the winter here where the water won't freeze. Clearly, the three pink beak sisters are drifting away from the group. The dominance of the yellow beaks, like my paternal authority, is starting to wane. It's normal they're cutting loose. Deep down, I know it's for the best. As we're about to leave, a bird invites himself over to the group. A duck, separated from her own kind and trying to find some company. I have often seen lone birds mingle in colonies of different species. Anything but alone is the motto of the migrators, and they're happy to welcome a bird that doesn't speak their language. Today, the air is full of a new scent they inhale at length. I know what lies in store, but they don't. And suddenly, there it is, the endless blue of the Atlantic which must awaken within them millennia of hidden memories. We have reached an essential stage on this great migration. Some birds stop here. The abandoned duck takes command. Where to go? She knows. She must recognize the terrain. Everything is new. The sand, the sounds, the smells, the light, even the taste of the water. The crashing waves intrigue them.
the big male keeps a lookout, cautious as ever. The pink beaks, led away by the little explorer, look for a venture away from his gaze. The beach is full of temptations, for better or worse. With no hands, they use their beaks. They nibble each item, examining its taste, smell, texture. They stamp the ground, hoping to dislodge a tasty morsel. Birds die in their thousands from accidentally ingesting the tons of litter dropped on beaches or returned by the sea. They're grown up now. I won't be with them forever. They must learn for themselves the difference between what's okay and what isn't. The big male hears the duck, but cannot see her. Is she lost? It sounds like there's nothing they can do to save her now. How could she resist such a male? with that two-tone outfit. She shows off her catch one last time. We won't see her again. One day my geese will also have to find a partner, one they'll keep for life. The tide rises, the sun sets. Now is the time for roosting. This great flight, common to migratory birds the world over, takes them from the shore to inland marshes to spend the night. Then return again in the morning. This coming and going is a vital lesson for my geese, who will spend many months here. We are a little early, but a few cranes have already started arriving from Northern Europe. The wild geese will arrive in the next few days. There is one final lesson to be learned, the most difficult, the less certain. The time has come to give my geese their freedom. In this nature reserve, with no hunting, they have every chance. But they will have to forget about me. The yellow beaks are already distant, the pink beaks still so affectionate. But I must leave them now.
rushing forward with them one last time. I picture them joining the wild geese to stop here. The school of migration has prepared them for it. Not only to learn from the other geese, but also to pass on what we have discovered together. I imagine them crossing the mountains to reach their winter pastures. And I see them one day teaching their own young the roots of migration.